What's up lazy dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. Today is time for part two of part two. our series about our market farming operation yeah. that we used to have here. Yeah. Uh, model that we think works very well for working folks like ourselves right. or maybe even retired folks that don't, <laughs> don't want to sit at a farmer's market all day. <laughs> uh, we had a great response to the first video and if you haven't seen that one you might want to watch that one before this one it might make more sense yeah so if you're on youtube watching this i'll put a link in the description below if you're on facebook watching this you can just go to our lazy dog farm page click videos and you'll see um, that video there that was posted last week so just to recap a small bit from that first video we we're talking about our vegetable bag model we did so we sold our produce in a bag with five different items uh, usually per week and it was a great model because we could vary the things in the bag We didn't always have to have the same thing in the bag and we didn't let people pick what went in the bag So with the wide diversity of crops we grew it made it easy for us to always have something to sell Right and you only bought it if you wanted it that week So we didn't pre-sell any bags we didn't do any like pre-orders anything like that um, That worked best for us because we didn't have to keep up with it, number one. And two, if you didn't have the produce, you didn't have to post that week. We almost always had the produce, but how much we had varied week to week. Right. So we had somebody ask, how many bags did you normally sell? Our goal was always to sell a minimum of 10 bags, but sometimes we sold upwards of 20, 25, 30 bags a week because as Travis mentioned in the last video, I work in multiple different towns every week specifically two different towns a week but up to three different towns a week so it really opened our customer base because i was able to say hey i'm coming here this week and so we'd get a lot of those people who weren't used to getting our bags every week right and and we had a lot of customers who didn't want a bag every week right. they wanted a bag every two weeks yeah. some just wanted one every month and mm -hmm. so the flexibility of our model allowed for that and We'd have some two times a month customers. We had some people that wanted one every week. Every week. So um, that model allowed for that flexibility for us to serve the customers and them to get a bag whenever they wanted it. Before you get into that, I want to say, I know that you mentioned that it we didn't have to have the same thing every week, but I think that that is what is key is that you don't want to have the same thing every week. You We really saw customers drop off when you have the same thing every week. But I mean, that's just normal. Nobody wants cucumbers every single week. I mean, there's only so much you can do with them. Right. So I thought it was really important to us to have a variety of items and to not have the same thing every week. And if we did have a customers every week, I tried to keep up with what they got last week and tried to make sure I gave them at least two or three things different next week. So right. that was, right. I think that's important because otherwise they'll be like, well, I've gotten cucumbers six times. So. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the third video we do where we mention or discuss some of the marketing aspects of it, how mm -hmm. we, we got the word out there right. about the bags and what we had in them. But on this week's video, I want to talk about what we grew, what we put in the bags, how we knew how we knew how much to grow, which we, you know, is is a little hairy there. How we determined how much to grow, I'll say that. Yeah. And also the crops that we grew just because people wanted them and then the crops that were the really big money makers for us or the crops that i think are the big money makers on a market farm down here now i'll preface this with what you grow and what you sell is going to depend on where you live right there's different demand different places if you're up north right. where okri is not a real popular crop you might grow broke go broke trying to sell okri up there mm -hmm. if you're down here you need staples, you need okra, you need corn, you need potatoes, stuff like that that people are used to eating around here. So a lot of this is relative and will depend on the market where you live. It also depends on how much time you have to pick what you pick. And I know Travis, this is really gonna be all Travis in this video. You're the brains behind that side of the operation. But like, don't grow microgreens if you don't wanna be bent over <laughs> cutting microgreens. Same thing for spinach. Like don't, you have to realize what you're gonna grow, how much time it takes to cut it, to harvest it, and how well it keeps once you've harvested. Right. So those are other things, I'm sure you'll touch on that, but I didn't realize that aspect of it until I've been out here having to harvest daily with you because I helped you some, 
but I just did what you told me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I knew, like, okay, these tomatoes can only be kept good for this amount of time, so we can only pick them, you know, things like that. That was mostly you, but now, recently, since I've been out here so much, I know what can be picked daily and what will hold well in the fridge and won't hold, hold well. Right. So, we'll discuss kind of each vegetable we grew. I made a list here. I think I've got everything got covered. Got notepads. So uh, but the real. things to consider here with each of these vegetables is how much harvest are you going to get compared to the amount of space this is going to require right. in the garden or how long it's going to take to grow it out. Mm -hmm. What kind of processing there is. Is this something I got to wash or is this something I can harvest, throw in a bag, it's ready for the customer. The other thing is, how well does it store? Is this yeah. something I got to pick day before bag delivery, or can I pick it any time of the week and it's usually good for a couple weeks? So, several things to consider here. So, we'll jump into it. Start off with the warm season veggies. I just split this up into warm season and the cool season veggies. So, talk about what months this is. Well, that's tough because you get some overlap here. I know, like, but I mean, in, like in the early spring, we're getting some overlap between some cool season veggies that we're still harvesting and some warm season stuff. Right. So I just split it up into warm season and cool season. Now, do know real quick, we always took off July, usually most of July, August, and most of September. So we were not selling bags in those times because there's literally nothing growing except okra and peppers. And we didn't have a lot of demand for bags during that time because that summer months, a lot of people are going on traveling. vacation all right. the time, traveling and uh, not staying at home cooking. Once once school started back, we would see a little uh -huh. bit pick back up. But during the summer months, especially July, August or so, we would take a break. Okay, so let's start off with the warm season veggies here. Summer squash, we grew a lot of summer squash. And I would succession plant summer squash. So we'd, we'd plant it as early as we could in spring. I would usually plant at least one 40 foot row or maybe even two 30 foot rows of it. I like to have a different, uh, a wide range of variety there. Yes. So we would have green zucchini, yellow zucchini, straight neck squash, patty pan squash. And we like that variety because I could, one week I could give everybody patty pan squash or some people patty pan squash. The next week I could give those people zucchini. The next week I could give them straight neck squash. And, and we could kind of vary that up. That way people were getting different stuff. Right. But we, Still in the same family that we were able to grow in the same plot. Right. And uh, as soon as we started seeing some really bumper production from that first planting of squash, we would go ahead and plant another one because we knew that first one was going to drop off. We'd have more squash coming through. And we'd have squash production all the way, sometimes into late July when the disease and bug pressure just got so bad. So summer squash was a big, big winter for us. And there's not a, there's a little bit of processing time there. We would wash them because they just get dirty. And if you put them in the fridge dirty, they, they just get kind of nasty. Right. So what we would do is we just put them in the sink. We wouldn't scrub them. We just rinse them off, let them dry on the counter on a towel. Overnight. Once they were dry, we would bag them up, put them in the fridge, and they're usually good for at least a week or so like that. You cannot put them in the bag wet because then it builds moisture and then they start rotting. And if one rots, they all rot. Right. So do know that. Another thing really quick that I want to mention at the beginning of this video is when you're going through this and you're picking your seeds, don't pick seeds that you see at the ga like grocery store. Like that is the allure of this whole bag. Like grow the patty pan. You can't buy that. I've never seen that in a grocery store unless you're at like a specialty, all food natural yeah, yeah. store. Yellow zucchini. I, I don't mean, see that you don't at the see that. Store. You don't see that pretty Romanesque. Uh, is that what it's called? Yeah, that we grew this year. Right. Yeah. So pick things that aren't just your regular crook neck yellow squash. Like you can buy that anywhere. You got to differentiate yourself somehow, and this is how you do it. Is in your seeds. The growing time is almost the same across the board For with all squash, of these. Yeah. So, my little tip of the day. <laughs> so, summer squash was a big money maker for us. And we got cucumbers. Lord, we would always cool. grow slicing cucumbers and pickling cucumbers. Usually yeah. I would take a 40 foot row and I would split it in half. But sometimes I would do a whole row of picklers and a whole row right. of slicers. It just depended. But I liked having both. So I'd give somebody picklers one week, slicers the next right. week. and uh, People like that because you can't buy pickling cucumbers again at the grocery store. That's right. At least not our grocery store you can. People like to be able to put up their own fridge cucumber. Yeah. I mean, and growing cucumbers. some of the hybrid varieties there, you get so much production. And so cucumbers much. is one of those things you can really count on to have in the bag mm -hmm. if, if something else is struggling. So right. we did grow a lot of cucumbers. Same thing with the summer squash there. We'd rinse them, let them dry on the counter, then bag them up. Green beans. So we would do green beans. 
I didn't really like doing green beans, but they were a decent seller in the bags. Um, pole beans are a lot better if you're doing this than bush beans on the yeah. ground because they're aggravating to pick. But if you've got a good section of pole beans, you can uh, you can pick a, a good bit. And you know, just a couple big handfuls of beans is plenty enough for a side for family four, which yeah. is what we're going for. So we would do some green beans. Potatoes, potatoes, Irish potatoes were a big one for us. So down here we plant those in February. We harvest around May. The great thing about those, no processing and they store well. So once we harvest them all at one time, we put them on our rack underneath the barn that you might have seen there. And that's easy bag packing right there. Because right. they're just sitting there. All you got to do is grab one of those little yeah. plastic bags I showed you throw a few potatoes in there, tie it up, boom, you're ready to go. You have those there. That's why we always grew so many potatoes is because they would store there for several months mm -hmm. and it was always an easy bag item. You knew you had that item. You didn't have to use it every week, That's right. but you had it there if, if you, you needed, needed it. it. Right. And if, especially if you got several different kinds of potatoes, right. anything you can grow that doesn't take a lot of harvesting or processing time that That's can the... store on the rack like that, that's your big time saver. Yeah. So think of this like meal planning, like something you can just grab in the fridge. That's potatoes. Yep. Something you had. Peppers. So we still do grow a wide variety of peppers, but we especially did when we were market farming. Uh, we didn't put a lot of hot peppers in the bag because most of our customers didn't care for them. We had a few customers right. that wanted them, so we would give them hot peppers. Usually I would actually separate out the peppers. I mm -hmm. wouldn't just make a medley. I would do bell peppers for some people one week, banana peppers, some other kind of sweet pepper. Having that variety makes it look like you're getting different stuff every yeah, week. Yeah, right, um, so, right. So that's really good. Uh, good to grow a different variety of peppers. I would only grow uh, three or four plants of each variety. It didn't take a lot uh, because you weren't using all your bell peppers you know, you would use bell peppers one week, then you wouldn't use bell peppers again to, you know, two or three weeks down the road when you had more. And it allowed you to kind of stagger your pepper picking so you wasn't depleting your whole supply at one right. time. And try to grow things that are sweet peppers, but not just bell peppers. So a lot of people really like the banana peppers because you could stuff those with cream you know, cheese like and the salt. Cubanels, stuff Cubanels, like that. something like that. So think of your milder peppers, because what's somebody gonna do with a bag of jalapenos? You know, I mean, you might could candy them, but people are going to be like, uh, can you please leave yeah. those jalapenos out? Because that's not, I mean, a, a lot of people aren't really processing their own food. If they are, they would have grown it themselves. So. Right. The next one's tomatoes. And surprisingly, I know tomatoes is up there with sweet corn is probably the most popular vegetable backyard crop out there. Tomatoes were not a huge mover of the needle for us. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if that's just because people around here growing their own. They got their own in their backyard, and they don't really appreciate the the difference in flavor between our tomatoes and what's at the grocery store. Yeah. I don't really know why. I didn't like growing tomatoes for it. They're just so perishable. They're hard right. to transport in the bag. We They're did heavy. tomatoes. We would use tomatoes, but um, I. They just didn't do well for us. They do well sitting on a market farm stand where you mm -hmm. got them in a basket. But for the bag model, tomatoes didn't work super well for us. Cherry tomatoes. Which I was about to say, cherry tomatoes are did. an exception. Yes. Those yellow gold tomatoes, people uh, raised about those. Yeah. And the reason why is because those were easy things for lunch boxes for people's kids. Those mm -hmm. are easy things to throw in a salad. Sometimes when you get a big tomato, you're like, well, I guess I have to save this for a sandwich. You know, you didn't quite know what to do with it, but those little ones, people were throwing them in pasta, whatever. So that would be the yeah. exception of And that. we would put those in those plastic clamshells we showed you last week. So cherry tomatoes work way better for us right. than big tomatoes. Um, eggplant. We would do eggplant. Um, not everybody was a huge fan of eggplant, but it was something easy to grow, something easy to keep in the bags. Yeah. We would do a variety. We would do some of the Japanese longer eggplant. Mm -hmm. We would do some of the standard kind of black beauty eggplant. We used a decent amount of eggplant. Okri. Okri is one of those where you can kind of butter your bread and make your money off okri because you get so much production over right. a long window with okri. And it's one of those things you can grow well into the summer. So towards the end of our uh, bag selling, before we kind of took a break in late summer, we always had some okri production there. Mm -hmm. Always. 
sweet corn. Now, I know everybody loves sweet corn, and we would grow sweet corn, and we would sell some sweet corn in our bags, but we most of the sweet corn we grow, we actually we put, put up, up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It was what I call, it was a good draw. So if you had sweet corn, you were gonna sell a lot of bags that week. But because it's a one-time harvest, and unless you succession plant it, and sweet corn takes up a good bit of area to grow, uh, you're not gonna have sweet corn every week. We really would only have sweet corn maybe two to four, uh, depending on how many plantings I did, but two to four times a year. So it was a good draw. It got a lot of people buying bags. Right. We would usually sell at least 30 bags when we had sweet corn. Right. But uh, it was not something you can count on unless you succession plant it. And um, you're not making a whole lot of money off the sweet corn. We would do... Because uh, of fertilizer and seeds. Yeah, we would do five or six ears. We were getting about a dollar an ear for it. But when you consider the time investment it takes to go in, to grow in sweet corn, it's not a huge money maker. But something, it's one of those things you just kind of got to have. And you know you're going to get a big sales week when you have the sweet right. corn. And if you sell, if you have it though, you got to sell it. Yeah. So it's not like something you can harvest and wait until next week. And you, you got to move it. And you have to tell your customers that because I think that they're not aware that this kind of corn is not like what you're buying in the grocery store. So you have to really make people aware of you got to cook this corn, it's going to go bad. Or you got to refrigerate this or you got to pick this up yeah. quick because it's not going to stay. And we're not going to have corn again. So right. if you want it, this is your chance. Yeah. So you got to create a little bit of urgency there. Right. Uh, the last few warm seeds and veggies here. Winter squash. We couldn't do the real big winter squash because mm -hmm. they wouldn't fit inside of a bag, but we would do butternuts. We, excuse me, we would do some of the smaller winter squash. Yeah. And those are like potatoes. They do really, it's a one time harvest. You store them underneath the barn, they're there. When you pack in bags, you don't have to re pick them. You just grab them off the rack, yeah. throw them in the bag, and, um, you know, they take up a lot of space. For the money you get off the space they require may not be that great, but the fact that they store so well and it's an easy item to grab off the shelf, and they just just made it a good option for right. us. Same thing with sweet potatoes. You know, we harvest. We'll be harvesting sweet potatoes soon. We harvest them late summer, early fall around here, and you put the sweet potatoes on the rack. They store well into the winter, and you just grab them off there. There's not a whole lot of process, and makes mm -hmm. for quick packing. Mm -hmm. A few of the warm season veggies we didn't do and why we didn't do them. So we didn't do butter beans, field peas, or any kind of thing that had to be shelled. Because Whew. nobody wants oh. to buy something they got to shell. And you can't afford, you have to charge, you know, more for the bag if you yeah. shelled them for people. I right. don't have a sheller here. Right. Um, so that just didn't really work with our model. The other thing, melons, watermelons are just too big to go in the bag and, and pumpkins uh, at least any decent sized pumpkin were too big to go in the bag. Now, if you were delivering these, I could see that. Yeah. You know, it's still, it's still heavy though. Y'all got to think that's a lot of, yeah, a yeah, lot you, of work loading up all these you load up 20 the pumpkins or so. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's more of like, is it worth it to me? Is it worth the effort? And for us, it wasn't, um, you know, if we had a few small pumpkins, I think not the Seminole that you grew one year. The Seminoles did work well. They so, store really well. Right. Now, those may have not been able to go in the bag, but if I was doing deliveries and I just had five deliveries, I could put five pumpkins in the back of my car real quick and I'd grab one in the bag and when I was taking it to people's houses. But that's, you know, I was charging extra for that. You have to build that into your price because it's a lot of extra work. <laughs> right. Yeah. And convincing people to try to eat those pumpkins, sometimes a little difficult. They just thought they were cute. Yeah. A lot of people didn't actually end up eating them. Right. Okay, so that's all the warm season stuff that I can remember. Uh, now for the cool season stuff. And that, like I said, there was some overlap between some of these. So let's start off with beets. Beets were not popular with everybody, but a lot of people did like the beets. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about beets is it's kind of like um, we can succession plant them just like we do summer squash right. in the warmer season. We can succession plant beets during the cooler season and always have them in the garden. Just yeah. plant some every 30, 40 days or so, and they work really well. And you didn't necessarily <coughs> have to pick every single beet right then. Uh -uh. You could leave it in there. I mean, that's another thing is we weren't having to harvest all the beets at one time, wash all the beets. Right. You would harvest a good amount, wash, and then you could wait till next week to harvest more. Yeah, during the cool season, 
down here, beets hold really well in the soil, which means you don't have to harvest them all at one time. If some are ready, they're kind of growing slow that time of year. Right. And you can just pick what you're going to need for the week. Now with the beets, what I would do, the tops didn't hold up well in the bags. They you. wilt. Yeah, they wilt bad. So I would rip the tops off, usually just chop and drop those in the garden. I'd put them in one of those plastic baskets you might have seen us use. I'd wash them. I'd let them dry in the sun. Once they dried, I'd bag them up. So right. there's a little bit of processing time with the beets, but the fact that they hold well in the soil, we can just harvest them as we need them, uh, worked out well. They hold well in a bag too. Yeah, they do store well for multiple weeks in the bag. So right. the customer didn't have to use them right away. Carrots. So around oh, here we plant the carrots. money. <laughs> yeah, we plant carrots in October and they're usually ready to harvest um, mid to late winter, around February or so, February, March. And the carrots hold well in the soil too in that late winter early spring time frame so we don't have to dig them all at one time same thing with the beets i'd pull them take the, i would remove the tops and uh, i know I, people say you can eat the tops it wasn't worth us to worth it to us processing wise to leave the tops on there right. they got too wet they made everything in the bag wet yeah we couldn't do it yeah so we i would do them just like the beets i'd rip the tops off when i was harvesting put them all in a basket rinse them off wouldn't scrub them rinse them off right. let them dry bag them up Carrots, for the space they require, give you a ton of money a ton. for a certain space. You plant one 40-foot double row of carrots, you have got several hundred dollars, if not more than that, right there. So, and um, that, is, that is what kept people coming back. Yep. Carrots. Carrots. I mean, and number one, they can also stay in your fridge four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all knew that. And we would, we would grow purple carrots, orange carrots, you yellow got, carrots. Yeah. So one week we'd do orange, one week we'd do purple. And they taste different. I think they taste different. They have different flavor profiles. Yeah. Grow every kind of carrot you can. <laughs> carrots were a big, big winner for us. Huge. Brussels sprouts and broccoli. I'm going to group these together. Well, no, let's separate them. So Brussels sprouts, we can only really grow one round of Brussels sprouts here. We'll yeah. plant them in the fall. They'll be ready early winter and sometimes they do okay sometimes they don't brussels sprouts are kind of like sweet corn for the cool season it's a good draw you're really not making a whole lot of money off the brussels sprouts by the time you pick them off it takes a long time to grow them they take up a decent amount of space for what you're getting uh, there's some processing time now sometimes we would sell them on the stalk but sometimes not everyone on the stalk looked great and we'd have to pick them off yeah so decent amount of processing time there but when we had Brussels sprouts, people were really excited about buying the bag. I mean, I loved them. They're so, delicious. See, it was one of those draw crops. You're not going to make a whole lot of money off of it, but it'd get people buying the bags, so then you could make money off the other stuff in the bags. Broccoli is the same way. People loved broccoli. And to me, there's a lot of things we grow where there's a huge taste difference between what we have and what's in the grocery store. I can't tell a huge difference between our broccoli and grocery store broccoli. Maybe some people can. I can. But people loved when we had broccoli. But I hated growing broccoli because <laughs> it takes up a good bit of I mean, the plant is like this big. The plant big is huge. For a and I've tried big. really intensive plantings of it, and the heads never get big. So yeah. the plant takes up a good bit of space for this one little head. And sometimes one head isn't enough for the bag. You're using two heads per right. bag. Right. It's a one time harvest for the most part. Yeah, it makes side shoots, but those side shoots were never enough to really mm -mm. fulfill the bag orders. We would just eat those ourselves. And then you got to be timely with your harvesting on it right. before it gets too seedy and yep. it didn't store well. And then it starts. It was just a pain, but I had to grow it because people loved it. And I knew if we had broccoli that week, we'd sell a lot of bags. Now we will grow this for ourselves for sure. I yeah. love broccoli. I love our broccoli. I think it's delicious. We eat it all the time. Here's something though I got to add in real quick. Like Travis said, don't get stingy. Do not just put one head of broccoli in because you saw that, well, that's, I'll have to use two plants. Use the two plants. There is nothing fresh, more frustrating, I think, to a customer or that will get you a bad reputation than they're stingy. They just gave me this one little head of broccoli. And y'all know one person can get one head of broccoli. Right. You know, so don't, don't do that. <laughs> Either don't grow it or if you're going to grow it, give a bunch. Yep. So. Cabbage. Cabbage was a good one because in the bag model, you're getting four or five dollars per head of cabbage. Right. Cabbage holds well. Unlike broccoli where the time, the harvest got to be timely, cabbage holds well and in the winter, we could leave it out there 
but we would do the beets and we would just harvest it as we need it. We didn't have to harvest a whole row of cabbage and worry about where to put it. Right. Each week I could go in there. So we'd grow red cabbage and green cabbage and I could just go pick what I needed for the mm -hmm. week and uh, it would hold well. Sometimes I grew some way too big heads of cabbage and they didn't really fit in the bag. Um, so the smaller ones worked for us, but a decent size head of cabbage, you know, about like a volleyball size was what we were going for. And I would say it's the best money-making crop out there, but it was a good one, a consistent one we knew we could grow during the cool season. Mm -hmm. Cauliflower. Oh, Cauliflower was popular, especially when you have colors. So if you yes. can grow that purple cauliflower, or that grow yellow it. cauliflower, the white helped too. Hell, but it's born. Yeah, but it, it, cauliflower just is takes beautiful pictures. Gosh, it's so pretty. It, it's so pretty when you take it's a great picture for of it. And, uh, <laughs> and we would usually get good bag sales when we had cauliflower ready. Yep. It's not quite as bad as broccoli about being sensitive to harvest mm -hmm. time. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a little bit of holding ability there, and it does store a little better in the fridge. Right. Actually, a good bit better than broccoli. And once people realize they can air fry cauliflower, their lives yeah, are changed. Game changer. The next one, and this is, I'll go over the big money makers, kind of recap that at the end. Collards. For my, in my opinion, for the space they require, for the time they're there, for the amount of harvest you get off of them, there's not a crop you can grow for a market farm that makes more money for you. Than collards. What about mustards? Uh, no, I just say collards. You can harvest them longer. Okay. Um, I'd say collards. Collards, okay. in my opinion, are the the most profitable crop you mm -hmm. can grow on a market farm. Okay. Um, just because you can, we can harvest them over and over. We can plant them in October. We can be harvesting those things a lot of times all the way through May, yeah. and and just. You know, one seed or you know i mean just a few seeds you're one, just getting all, one plant you're just getting so much off of it kale same thing Trev. yeah, yeah. kale's another one i was going to mention Sorry. kale is right up there with collards as far as being the money maker a lot of people liked our kale because it tasted so, so much good better. and it doesn't hurt their stomach because we don't pump it full of nitrogen that's same right thing with the collards so kale was another one you get all those repeat harvests it, it grows all throughout the winter you just keep cropping the leaves leaving some on the top kale collards big time money makers yeah garlic leeks and onions let's talk about those a little bit garlic we would do elephant garlic we would it usually doesn't get harvested to around may or so around here okay. it's one of those good items to have on the rack in the barn we wouldn't push the garlic sales but it was an item we had there if we needed an extra bag item we had it right there it was easy to grab right throw in the bags we would usually do two heads of garlic mm -hmm. per bag um, onions you know, onions, we can usually get them to store three months or so down here. That's another item. You harvest them one time, you got them on the rack. Easy to grab the onions, throw them in the bag. Yeah. Leeks. Leeks, we grew leeks. Leeks were neat to grow. I would say it wasn't that great of a seller in the bags because a lot of people aren't used to cooking them. Uh, but I really like growing them. They take a little longer to harvest because you got to dig them. But it was just one of those things we grew because we could and it added some diversity to the bags. Right. Offered just something that you weren't going to get. And then we've got lettuce. So lettuce is one of those things we would succession plant. We planted in October and about every other month, month and a half, we'd plant another round. Butterhead, romaine, leaf lettuce. Around here in the grocery stores, you really can only get spring mix and icebergs. So having those specialty right. lettuces really helps We're sell the, the bags. Um, we didn't wash our lettuce mm -mm. because if you wash it, then you got to dry it and need some extra equipment to do that it takes a lot more time so by the time if we did all that and invested in all that we wouldn't be getting near the profit margins right. that we wanted on our lettuce yes. so, so those are things you have to weigh right. <laughs> i think that's mm -hmm. like there's a, how much are you going to invest in things to process it to weigh it, all that stuff we decided not to invest in that so we had a bigger profit margin yep so uh, so the trick to that since i wasn't washing it i had to pick it when it was dry I right pick it first thing in the morning or Which cut applies. it first thing in the morning uh applies it yeah collards kale a lot of the greens you want to pick those dry right so i'd cut lettuce in the afternoon it was dry it usually stores well in the fridge for mm -hmm. um at least a week or so uh, i'll try to pick if i knew we were going to get a heavy rain i'd try to cut it before the end because those rains can splash a lot of dirt on them i'd cut i would cut off the bottoms and kind of clean up the base of it a little yeah. bit and it was pretty clean it just needed yeah. a rinse but we didn't wash those just because it the, the labor time involved and it didn't work out right uh radishes we grew a few radishes they weren't a big um you know 
a big draw or anything, mm -hmm. but it's something you can grow quick in 30 days, something yeah. you can just have. I would always grow some just to have them. Sometimes we'd never put them in the bag, but we'd have them if we needed them for an extra item. Right. Then we got rutabagas. Now rutabagas is a great dual purpose crop because we would harvest the greens and then use the actual rutabaga root. So right. uh, we'll get into this more when we start growing our rutabagas this fall. But the way we do it is we crop the leaves as they grow, kind of like we do kale, leaving a few at the top. It seems to make the root bigger and those greens are really good. So we would sell greens until the root got bigger and then we would sell the root. So a pretty profitable crop considering you're getting Twice. those dual purposes mm -hmm. off of it. The things we didn't do in the cool season, we did do, I won't say we didn't do these, we did do some mixed greens, some mustard greens, some like cut and come again greens, but they just didn't store well for us. They weren't a huge draw. Not a lot of people cared about them. Cause they were, the ones we grew were a little spicy. They're also hard to harvest. You have to like lean yeah. over yeah. and A lot cut of work and, and harvest them. So we, we did those one season, we quit doing those. Of course, we didn't do English peas because you got to shell those. Although they're really good, we didn't do English mm -hmm. peas. And we didn't do spinach because spinach is just a booger to harvest. Right. I was going to say, some of these things that we're saying are issues. Yes, there are tools out there that make all these things easier. Right. It's we were not investing in those tools, the $500, $600. That wasn't worth it to us. It was just easier. We had enough stuff that people liked that it wasn't important to us to, hey, let's grow a mixed grain. Right, you we know? didn't have enough demand for it to justify the cost of adding exactly. all the extra equipment. Yes. So just to recap, the big money crops we grew, collards, kale, cucumbers, summer squash, peppers, rutabagas, because we get the greens and the roots, carrots, mm -hmm. and of course, okri. Those were probably, considering the effort going into growing them, right. the harvest and the process and the t amount of time they grow the production window, those were our big money makers, and, and I still say collards is number one. Uh, we did do some a few fruits. If you watch the videos, you know we have several fruit sources here on the homestead. So when those were ready, we would add those. We'd do right. mulberries in early spring. That was usually followed by blackberries. We would do figs. We would also do muscadines. That was a great one for the summer this time of year. We'd do blueberries when our blueberry tree was making a lot. Yeah. Um, we got lucky with all these though because all of these are already planted on our land except the blackberries Yeah, and before we planted our own blackberries we picked wild blackberries. Yeah, so we had a lot of that stuff here It's just utilizing it, right? Um, okay, so a lot of information to take in there <laughs> Just yeah. a few key takeaways here to wrap this up variety is key You got to have you want to have a lot of different varieties. Don't just plant one type of squash Don't just right. plant one type of carrots. Don't just plant one type of cucumbers have a variety that way it looks like people are getting different stuff although to you it seems like all Same. like cucumbers or summer squash but it's really not i mean the t you know people right. like being able to try that different stuff yeah grow things they can't find at the grocery yes. store yes now you are obviously going to grow potatoes or corn that right. they can find at the grocery store but you have the opportunity to grow a lot of things that people can't find right. at a grocery store that's what makes you stand out and we will talk about this next on the next video but showing and displaying how you were different than what you can buy at the grocery store is going to be key that's right to you being successful that's right you're going to make a lot more money on some things you grow than you are other things right. and it's just going to kind of average out we didn't make much money on sweet corn but we knew if we had sweet corn we were going to sell a lot of bags we made right. a ton of money on collards and kale and stuff like that yeah some stuff you're going to make a lot of money on some stuff you're not but you got to have for this model got to have a lot of different stuff mm -hmm. or else it doesn't work. And that's how it averages out. And that's why we decided the bag model rather than selling it by itself. Because those lettuces, we probably could have sold $8 for two heads. But we couldn't have sold the garlic $5 for three of them. So whenever you put the two heads of lettuce in there and a few garlic and a few potatoes, that's how your bag ends up being profitable. That's right. Mm -hmm. The last thing, plant more than you'll think you'll need. Yeah. Most of this stuff, you know, I was planting several 30 or 40 foot rows of it to fulfill those anywhere from 15 to 30 bags a week. Plant more than you'll need. And we'll get into this in the marketing discussion next week. But it's, it's a good idea to have a wholesaler kind of on the, the back burner right. that will take the extra stuff for a way to get rid of the extra stuff. We always, I would say we always had extra stuff, but sometimes we would have extra stuff and we had a little country store here um, locally that we would wholesale that extra stuff to at a discount compared to what we were selling in the bags. 
and that was a good way to make sure nothing went to waste between what when what we were selling in the bags right. and what we were eating here right so lots and lots of information there hope you guys enjoyed that and on the next video we're going to talk about the marketing aspect of it and if there's any other parts of this model or, or what we did that yeah. we haven't covered right. that you want to hear us cover definitely put that in the comments below or if you have any questions about any of the things here or that you felt like we omitted some things or want to know well, why didn't you grow this put those in the comments below as well and in the next video we're going to talk about sort of maybe things we didn't do but things that we w wanted to do or should have done or yeah. that we think would be great Ways options we could have improved. right to do in the future so i think those tips are always handy when we were around though i don't remember anything being right. like this so you know we want you to be successful and sort of share some things that we saw and some things that we saw from our customers and we'll get into how we differentiated and told people what was in your bag and things like that in the yeah. next video all right all right all right <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did make sure to subscribe ring the bell like and share and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm bye oh well mm -hmm. by the beauty of your life